Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this, a thinking with John Holland Kay, the Chief Executive of Heathrow Airport. Uh, thank you uh, for getting up and joining us relatively early. I hope that everyone is keeping safe, keeping uh, their spirits up, and above all, keeping warm uh, today. Um, John, a big thank you to you for, for joining us. Um, we set up these Tuesday mornings, a, a, an hour-long conversation with, with the chief executives of some of the biggest uh, businesses in the UK and, in fact, in the world, because one of our thoughts was, if you look at journalism more generally, that you see some of these on the Sunday morning talk shows, particularly with politicians, but rarely is there a moment to stop and sit and hear from someone steering a business that is critical to the way the country works and to understand the choices they've got. And because it's your first thinking, I just wanted to explain their aim is that it's like some big chaotic open news meeting. So I'll put some questions and thoughts to you, but I'm gonna bring in people, you know, who join us, Tortoise members who'll have thoughts and views too. It, it's part of our series of thinkings this year on accelerating net zero. And so I'm sure the bulk of the conversation will be around climate and, and in fact, whether there is such a thing as sustainable aviation. Um, but, but can we start with where we are? Um, some people have seen the, the Mail on Sunday piece about the, the pressures on airports, uh, the prospects of potentially further uh, redundancies. We're trying to wrap our heads around COVID and quarantine. So, so can we just start with how, how empty is the airport now? And what does that mean to the prospects for Heathrow? Well, good morning. It's great to be here and have a, a longer conversation. Uh, well, if you were to go through Heathrow today, you'd see that the roads around the airport are very quiet. Uh, the railway stations, there's almost nobody in there. The terminals themselves have very few passengers going through them. And if you imagine yourself going through security, there's maybe a couple of lanes open. And we actually only have two terminals open at all at the moment. And we are serving about um, five to 10% of the number of passengers that we would normally serve. And during lockdown, of course, everyone has been told not to fly and only essential travel is allowed to take place. So it's a very quiet place. Um, my colleagues there, and I was, I was in the airport on Friday, um, are, are very bored. They love seeing people and there's very few people going through. And this is important for the UK. We're a small island trading nation. We, we support nearly 70 million people in this country, and we can't support the size of economy we have unless we are an outward looking trading nation. A lot of the jobs in the UK, millions of them, depend upon aviation in one way or another. And they particularly rely on aviation through Heathrow because the same passenger planes that carry you on your holidays or, or take you to uh, business trips around the world also carry the UK's supply chain. 50% mm -hmm. um, of all the UK's exports and the imports that go to make things fly on planes, as do service, the service sector, which is very often journalists or business people going around the world. So it's vital to the UK economy. Um, while planes are grounded at Heathrow, the UK economy is being held back. And, and that's why it's so important that we find a way through this to get people flying again. And John, what's, what, what's going on? Uh, just before we started, I was saying that last night we had Nadim Zahawi, the minister for the rollout of vaccines. And there was so much to talk about. I, I didn't get the chance to say to him, it's extraordinary that in the time that it's taken to vaccinate nearly 13 million people, the UK has still not really managed to nail down its approach to air travel borders and quarantine. It's only the beginning of next week that some system of quarantine, a meaningful system of quarantine takes place. What do you think explains that? Is it, is it just an ideological reluctance to close borders or is it a practical inability to get the airports and the airlines and the hospitality sector together to fix this problem? No, bear in mind there has been a very meaningful set of controls on the border for quite some time. Currently, anyone who comes into the UK is required to go into quarantine for 10 days, having previously had a test to make sure they don't have COVID before they get on a plane. So there are very strict border controls in place already today. You have to fill out a passenger locator form before you uh, are allowed through the border, which, which shows where you are going to be staying. The 
change that's, that is coming in next week is that there will be a hotel quarantine requirement as well for passengers coming in from high risk countries, places like South Africa yeah. and Brazil. And there's a relatively small number of passengers who come through every day who, who have come from those countries. And the hotel quarantine system is not one that is used in all countries around the world by any means. It's typically been used by countries such as Australia and New Zealand, who have had an entirely different strategy to the UK. Their approach has been to try to eliminate the virus within their countries by closing their borders. So in <coughs> Australia, if you want to go in, they have a quota, quite a small quota for the number of people who are allowed into the country. All of those have to hotel quarantine. So it's a very different setup to the one that the UK is proposing, where it's just a targeted proportion of passengers who would be put in a hotel quarantine. And it's, it took the Australians a while to get their system up and running. So, uh, so actually the, the, the UK government's tried to do that in two weeks under intense uh, public scrutiny. And um, so it's, a, it's another layer to keep the country safe. We all understand why that's important. And we are supporting the government to uh, make that work as effectively as we can. But, but John, can I, what, what I wanted to put to you was that we, we're, we're not really making our choices here. We're not neither closing the airports and then providing support for Heathrow, Manchester, the other airport businesses, or leaving them open and allowing them to get on with their with, with their jobs. And I, and I and I wondered, given the debate that's gone around this now for a year whether or not you think there's a better regime for supporting airports through this, because we can see that this is not going to end swiftly in the next couple of weeks. There are going to be very significant controls for some time to come, aren't there? Yes, I think there will be. And, and, and equally, that there need to be controls. We, we're fortunate in the UK that we are further advanced with the vaccination programme than any other country. We have taken a different strategy, if you like, to places like Australia and New Zealand. They've sought to eliminate COVID. We have sought to contain it and mm -hmm. then rely on vaccination to eliminate it. And that's why we are so far ahead. And you can understand that the government doesn't want to, uh, to blow that, uh, that lead that they have in vaccination by exposing the country to new variants that they don't understand. And that's why at this point in time, having tighter controls may be the right thing to do. And mm -hmm. we're supporting the government with that. But it's not sustainable in the long term. We are a... We're, we're a small island. We do need to be able to fly to other places. So we've got to find a way of getting people flying again safely without bringing COVID in. And the best way to do that, in our view, is to test people for COVID before they get on the plane. So you don't have anyone coming into the country who has COVID. Now the challenge there becomes, how do you make sure that people have had, a, had the right kind of tests and that it's them who's had the test and not their, uh, not their cousin? And, uh, and the, there's quite a lot of work going on to try to pin down how we can make that work. But that, I think, will be one of the ways in which we get people flying again in a way that keeps the country safe. So, so John, can you do those, do those things one at a time? What's your expectation for 2021? For example, let's say Easter. Do you think that there real, will be a significant increase? You say that it's currently 5 to 10% capacity at Heathrow. What's your expectation come Easter? Well, actually, this is the big question. When will we see things turn around? Uh, we know that people want to fly. It's one of the things that, if you look at Google searches, it's the most, most thing uh, that, that people are doing as they're sitting at home, locked down. They want to go on holiday, they want to go on business, but they can't at the moment. And the main constraint on travel is the border controls that are imposed in the UK and elsewhere around the world. Um, when will the turn come? Well, it's possible that it could come before Easter. I think at the moment, um, everything the government's doing makes that unlikely. Um, I think there's a very good chance that it will happen before the summer. But if it doesn't happen before the summer, um, and summer is the time when most uh, leisure airports and airlines um, make, mo make money, they don't make any money in the winter. Um, if there isn't a summer, then I think the UK aviation industry will be in a really deep crisis. And, uh, and that's when we'll see some uh, airlines and airports getting into uh, financial distress. And that's where the government needs to be thinking ahead on what the roadmap is out of the COVID crisis, how they are going to open up aviation again safely. And that's something I'd like to see the Prime Minister talking about when he, when he lays out his roadmap for the country uh, next week. Because aviation is not just another economic sector, it is one of the enablers for the economy. Think about all the jobs that rely upon upon aviation to get exports around the world or 
bring the supply chain in or even bring students and tourists in. It's vital to so many jobs here in the UK. And it's got to be part of that roadmap that the Prime Minister presents. So I, I, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to that support in a moment, but I just wanted to pick up, I don't know whether you've seen, as you were speaking, Louise Simpson um, made this point about the experience she had on a plane about testing and capacity on the plane. I don't know, Louise, are you there? And I can uh, bring you in. Yes, I'm here. Hello, Louise. So will you just, will you just say to John, you, you sent the message your plane was full and there wasn't much coming. Will you just tell us about the journey that you took and, and what happened? Well, I mean, yeah, we took tests before we arrived because I actually thought we were meant to be doing that. There was no, there was no kind, you wouldn't have, I suppose people were wearing masks, other than that, there was no testing, there was no coherence in getting onto the plane. It was completely chaotic. People were going, you know how, it, it was like getting onto an easy jet flight in the middle of a summer holiday, quite frankly. And, you know, yes, we did have an essential journey. I promise we did, but, and I'm sure everybody else did. But if anyone had that, a COVID on that plane, there was no temperature. I would have thought a simple thing would have been temperature checking. It was, it was in the UK, Louise. Sorry, forgive me, Louise. Was it in the UK or was it international? Rota, Ed Edinburgh. Okay, but it was full. So you were flying out of Edinburgh or into Edinburgh? We were flying from London to Edinburgh. Um, yeah, it was a one-way trip. Um, um, it, you know, it was only ever planned as a one-way trip. We were meant to be driving down. But um, yes, yeah, so it was and, and in Scotland, you know, we were, asked, we were asked on arrival whether we had an essential trip and we did. So there was much more sense of a lockdown actually in Scotland than there was in London. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm, I was not worried to travel. But I must admit, I am surprised there was no temperature checking and there was no order in, in how you pass through the terminals and getting on the plane. And I would have thought with numbered seats, it would be really easy to sort of just put people on you know, number seat, number one, number two, number three in reverse, whatever. But we were all piling in in, 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 in groups like normal. I mean, it, it, John, it, yeah. Well, and, and, and Louise, can I ask, was that, was that one of the airlines out of Heathrow or was it another airport? Airways, British Airways Terminal 5. Terminal 5. Because, uh, well, well thank, thank you for that feedback. <laughs> when I was in um, Terminal 5 actually the other day, the airlines were boarding people by road to avoid exactly what you were describing. So if that's not happening systematically, then that's something I'll pick up with British Airways. But, I think but, but, uh, Sorry, go ahead. It would just be really easy to do that, you know, on that. I mean, you know, if, as I, you know, everybody was polite, everybody was nice, everybody was calm, there was no, nothing wrong. It's just that it, you wouldn't have felt you were in a global pandemic. So that, and that is the normal process, is to, is to board people by rows. But you, your point about, um, about temperature checks is, a, is an interesting one, because when we first started getting into uh, the first lockdown, we put in temperature tests at Heathrow, uh, the government uh, weren't supporting them at that time, uh, but we knew that um, passengers expected to see it. Um, and as research has gone on, um, they found that temperature checking is a very uh, poor way of identifying whether people have COVID or not. As a passenger, you get some reassurance out of it because you, you feel that you are being checked. It doesn't actually do much good for um, testing whether someone has COVID because there are plenty of other reasons why someone might have a high temperature. But there are also, um, uh, as we now know, a lot of people who don't have a high temperature when they do have COVID. Um, so, uh, but you raise an interesting point that, that people, I think it's the whole thing. That they are being looked after. I mean, the, I, I mean, I felt looked after and I felt fine because I'm kind of more relaxed probably than I should be about this thing. But I do, I just think that, you know, the mask wearing is sort of to make you feel that something's going on. And I think like a plague. Um, and I think the, um, and I think the temperature checking would be good. I, get your point that yeah. we could Louis. so i'm just gonna, i'm just going to interrupt because i know that we've got quite a good deal of uh climate to get through and there's quite a there's a queue queue of points i'm gonna f forgive me for interrupting but john i just want to finish up on this sort of section on covid and quarantine just on the financial support question right because it's it's unclear what you're really what what do you really need in terms of financial support if there is going to be diminished travel not just over easter but through the summer what does heathrow need well all we are asking for at the moment we don't we're not looking for any bailout we are well funded um, but we are looking for the same support that other sectors in the economy have had 
in particular, um, alleviation from business rates. So we are the biggest single business rates payer in the UK. We pay 116 million pounds a year. Um, the supermarkets who also pay business rates were given alleviation from business rates on day one, um, mm -hmm. but aviation has had nothing. Um, we were recently offered an eight million pound reduction in our business rates bill, um, which is, doesn't even cover one month of our business rates. And this is, this is important to us because we are doing everything we can with no income to keep our business going, to try to uh, protect jobs so that we are um, looking after our local communities, but also in a position that we can recover when we come out of this. And if we don't see some of these big fixed costs coming down, then that forces us to find other ways of cutting costs, such as making people redundant. And I hate doing that. You know, we have, we have really uh, fantastic people who, we, who, we, who are loyal to the company, uh, they work hard, uh, we've trained them. I don't want to have to make people redundant if there is an easy change that the government can make that they've made for the supermarkets that they're not prepared to make for, uh, for uh, airports as well. And I get, I get really angry about that because um, uh, these, these are people's livelihoods. Yeah. We're a very local employer and um, one of the, uh, our biggest airport uh, airline at Heathrow, British Airways, has had to lay off 10,000 people. Well, that's, that's a small town. Yeah. It's devastating to some local communities. And I really do not want to lose jobs if we can possibly save them. And is there, you, you, you were quite careful in the way in which you've pitched this so far, right? It's not, you haven't gone the route that some do, which is to say, if we don't get the business rates relief, <laughs> this many thousands of people will lose their job in 2021. But can you give us a sense of what happens if you don't get relief on 116 million? I mean, how many jobs do you think are at stake? Well, uh, we, we have... We have about um, 4,000 people who work in our frontline roles at the moment. Uh, this time last year, there were over 5,000. So about 20% of people have gone, um, all through voluntary severance. So we've not made anyone redundant. We have offered a package for them to leave if they want, and about 1,000 people have left. Um, uh, but we also know that anyone who wants to leave has gone. So any further cuts will be uh, compulsory redundancies. And that's, that's the change I don't want to make. And um, we currently have about 10% of, of the business we would normally have. And uh, we, would, uh, uh, we would probably lose um, over a thousand more people. Uh, that's another thousand families who don't have any income. And in an environment in the local economy, which has been devastated, we'll have very poor prospects of getting a new job in the foreseeable future. So that's what I want to avoid. And John, presumably the, the, the purpose of making this argument about business rates now is to get it resolved by the budget on March the 3rd. Is that, is that when you think you'll get an answer? Well, it could happen any time. Um, this, this happened for, for supermarkets on day one. Why has it taken so long for the government to act? Uh, actually, the supermarkets have been doing so well that they've given back the business rates uh, alleviation that the government gave them. So why don't the government reuse that money to go to other businesses that need support? It mm -hmm. makes no sense. And the, the thing about airports is that we, are, we have massive fixed costs. So uh, there's, a, there's an enormous infrastructure that goes with the airport. Even if we have no passengers flying, we need to keep that area secure. We need to keep all the, all the equipment um, safe and, and running. Um, so we need a couple of thousand people just to, uh, e even if we were closed, we have uh, big energy bills. Uh, we have um, a lot of maintenance that needs to go on. So we have about an 800 million pound fixed cost base, even if we were closed. Yeah. And so the 116 million of business rates is a very material chunk of that. And our choice really is people or business rates. And John, John one final question on this before, before we apply with this. What about the information you get from government? Because I can't you know, all of us are struggling with forward planning. All of us, I think, are quite frustrated that we don't get to see the world beyond February the 22nd, March the 8th. But the reality is, if you're running an airport, if you're trying to think through plans for spring, summer, you, you just can't be operating on a fortnightly rhythm. So, so do you get information from government that says, look, here's our best best case scenario here's our worst case scenario do you get a sense of what's likely and i'm asking this because people are all joining that want to know you know what do you think is yeah. most likely to be the, pat the, the pattern of opening up no we, we haven't had that yet and uh, to be fair to government 
for most of the last year, they have just had their heads down dealing with the pandemic. They haven't had a lot of time or bandwidth to think about what happens next. I think that's starting to change. Now the vaccine is starting to take, a, take effect. Government has a bit more space. And the fact that the prime minister is promis promising us that roadmap uh, in the next two weeks is a good sign. We all need something that we can plan around. Because for businesses, in the absence of any, of any uh, uh, positive plan from government, you can only make the worst case uh, judgment. Um, we, uh, we are burning through uh, millions of pounds of cash every day. We're being supported by our shareholders. The only thing we can do in the absence of some, some planning around when the market is going to open up again is cut costs. And uh, we have absolutely cut them to the bone right now. And uh, so this is why the roadmap is important to us. And it's also why we have been trying to help government over the last year in thinking about what might happen next. How might you open up the economy again? And um, how might you take a risk-based approach to restarting aviation, which, uh, which is what the government has, has uh, brought in over the last six months? So, so, so um, John, can we, uh, it's, it's so frustrating because I can see also there's this conversation now in the chat, similar to the one we had before we started about, supermarket space within the terminals and business rates but, but I fear that we'll lose time to talk about the sort of core subject so forgive me I'm going to sort of do a handbrake turn and and shift to talking about accelerating net zero before I come to you with any questions I just wanted to come to a couple of people who I suppose um, voice a sentiment that I think you've heard quite a lot in the last year which is a version of we, we've learned a lesson about our over-reliance on our aviation you know, the pandemic is a dress rehearsal for the climate crisis. You know, maybe the lesson of this should be that we just fly significantly less. And uh, I saw a comment from Lily Evans. I saw a comment from Stephen Rockman. And I wondered whether or not, Lily, I don't think you've got your camera, I'm told by Connor, but, but do you want to weigh in? Are you there? Yes. Hello. Can there. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm. Uh, this was the... Uh... I didn't expect this. I just saw a message, so I'm not suitably dressed. <laughs> so excuse me for that. I've got uh, my pajamas on below the... Uh, below the <laughs> desk, so yeah, I the... hear that, but this is above. <laughs> uh, so uh, I just wanted to ask, given the changes that have occurred in the environment, both in terms of uh, where UK is looking in terms of... Uh, what we want to do with the environment and uh, uh, need to uh, think more carefully how we go and travel really. What happens with the Heathrow extension and how is the thinking going about the business case for it? Mm -hmm. Lily, thank you. John. Great, well um, Lily, thank you for, uh, for raising that. And um, if I go back to James's point, I, I would agree with um, most of, of uh, the overview that James gave. The, uh, we will recover from COVID. Uh, it, is, it has been a devastating impact on all of us, but we will recover from it and the world will come back to some kind of normality. We won't come back from a climate crisis. And uh, this is an early warning for us that we need to take the signals that we've got about climate change seriously and do something about it. And that applies to all parts of our life, all parts of, of our business. Now, the, this, there's, a, there's an easy step from that that says, well, let's just stop flying. And, um, and that's the bit that I would challenge. Um, not because I think we should fly at any cost by any means. I, 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 I don't agree with that. Um, we need to protect the benefits of aviation in a world without carbon. And that means we need to take the carbon out of flying. Most of that carbon is in the fuel burnt on Mongol planes. So the first thing we should be doing is looking at how we can convert Mongol flying to net zero carbon, sustainable aviation fuel. And that is the shift that we are trying to get, not just the UK government to make, but governments around the world to make so that people in future generations can still enjoy the benefits of aviation. Now, if we are not able to do that, then we need to look at the kind of changes that you are talking about and think about a world without aviation. But before we jump straight to saying, let's just stop flying, let's look at a, an alternative. And there is a real alternative now that wasn't there uh, in as clear a way five or even 10 years ago. 
and you'll see this in the Committee for Climate Change's work, um, they agree that sustainable aviation fuels can be a significant part of the solution to making aviation uh, net zero carbon. And uh, just yesterday, actually, British Airways committed to a $400 million investment in a sustainable aviation fuel plant in the US, which will be producing by the end of next year. Um, so this really started to change quickly. And it's something we have been campaigning for for a number of years because, um, and it, it might seem odd that someone who runs a, a, an aviation business will be saying this, but who better to try to change uh, the way in which carbon intensive industries work than the people within those carbon intensive industries. It, it, it is not just for environmental campaigners to campaign on this, it needs to be businesses that make change and that's what we are trying to do. John, I, I, I was going to say there's, um, I see that, you know, Finley Asher is making a point about, you know, uh, how you improve the carbon efficiency of aviation and travel itself. And Catherine Simmons is asking whether or not you can actually change the, uh, the sort of the, the, the business model overall. I'm going to come to both of them in one moment, but will you just start, you know, I was reading some of the, you know, the case that was made by Sustainable Aviation, the Jet Zero Council around sustainable aviation fuels around technological efficiencies on planes themselves and around airspace. Can you just, for those people who, who are not kind of in the weeds of this, and I'm not, just explain the case that the industry is making to say, okay, we can actually fix this on an accelerated timetable. Right, thank you. <clears throat> so the, um, the document that James is referring to is something that we were involved in launching back in February of last year. Um, which was a sustainable aviation roadmap. And it was the first time that any aviation sector in the world had committed to net zero aviation and put a roadmap together for how you get there. And this is now being adopted um, by other countries around the world. And we've been building up a, uh, a, a coalition of the willing, if you like, um, of airlines and airports in places like the US and India and even the Middle East and China um, backing net zero aviation. And our aim is to make this a flagship goal for COP26 later this year and to get a global agreement at ICAO, which is the governing body for aviation in September 2022. So that's, that's what we're working towards. And there are, there are three planks to uh, reducing carbon emissions from aviation. One is simplifying airspace, which gets about a 10% reduction. And if you look to the routes that airlines have to fly at the moment, they're incredibly inefficient because of the way that air traffic controls work. So that's, that's one change that can be made. The second change, which has been um, happening uh, very effectively for decades, is changing the engine technology and the design of the aircraft so that it uh, burns less fuel. And actually people like Rolls-Royce have been fantastic at this kind of thing. But that will only reduce the um, emissions that a plane has. Um, what we need to do is to eliminate the fossil fuel emissions from planes. And that means changing the fuel that powers them. And for long haul flying, um, battery technology just won't work because the batteries would be too heavy. And so the choices are you either change the plane to something that burns hydrogen, or you change the fuel that they burn to a sustainable aviation fuel. And if you want to change global aviation by 2050, the only option is to change the fuel because the fleet replacement cycle for planes is around 25 years. So unless you have large scale zero plane, zero emission planes, in production today, you're not gonna be able to decarbonize aviation by 2050. So it's all about the fuel. There are two types of sustainable aviation fuel. One is energy from waste, and that's the kind of plant that uh, British Airways is investing in. They're using second generation waste. So this is uh, the stems from wheat that has been harvested and uh, domestic waste that is being turned into bioethanol and then turned into fuel. And then the other, which is more exciting, is synthetic fuel, <clears throat> where you take captured carbon and synthetic hydrogen, um, uh, blue hydrogen, combine them to make energy. And that's something that the UK um, is looking at becoming a leader in um, using the kind of uh, hydrogen investment that the government is getting behind. So uh, all of this technology exists, but it's all at a very small scale at the moment and not enough to get to um, uh, power the global aviation sector. And this is moving some government action to put a mandate in place that requires airlines to have a certain proportion of these 
sustainable fuels in their flames by certain dates. And the good thing about this fuel is that you can blend it with existing kerosene. So the faster you scale up, the faster that you can get to, to net zero. And the European Union is introducing this mandate. Some other countries around the world have done. We have been pushing the UK government to bring it in for about two years now. And I hope that that is something that we will see in the budget in a few weeks' time. Okay, John, there'll be, as you're, as you're speaking, I think they're going to be, the, there are two lines of sort of scepticism. One is the, even if you do it, can you do it fast enough? By 2050, is aviation still just taking up too much of the carbon budget? And the other one, which you hear when you talk about the energy transition too, is that so much is based on the hope of a delivery from this crisis from technology or from innovation. And so I just wanted to bring in sort of different voices who were making that point. Finley Asher, I was going to come in first, uh, if I might. Finley, will you put the point to John and I'm going to come to Catherine uh, mm -hmm. in a second after that. Finley. Hey, how are you doing? Yes, I, you mentioned Rolls-Royce. I've spent eight years working at Rolls-Royce on future aircraft technology and engines. And, and I now run a, a YouTube channel called Green Sky Thinking, going through some of the misconceptions we were just talking about there. So it's true, hydrogen and electric are too far off. Um, and the industry is really putting a lot of its hopes in sustainable aviation fuel. When you hear that word, you really need to read biofuels. Um, synthetic fuels were discussed there, but there's no plan to ramp those up right now. Um, biofuel has a very big land use change. Um, if you talk about fuel from waste, there just simply isn't enough waste on the planet to make enough fuel for aviation. So it would need to be fuel from crops and that's just not sustainable without causing more deforestation. Um, synthetic fuels are sort of three to five times the price of kerosene. So if that is your plan, flying is gonna get three to five times more expensive. And that brings into question the expansion of airports if flying is five times the cost. So I'd put that to you. Okay, well, let me pick up a couple of things there. First of all, um, if you look at the work, and I'm sure you have done, that the Energy Transitions Commission has done, they conclude that there is enough uh, energy from waste in the world to fuel global aviation, including the growth in global aviation, um, but only if, if uh, uh, second generation biofuels are kept for aviation, which is the least substitutable of the forms of transport, um, rather than being wasted as it currently is in going into cars where there is a very good alternative or into lorries. Um, but I, I'd agree that we should not be pinning all of our hopes just on that. Um, you talk about synthetic aviation fuels. They have been around, as you will know, for a long time, uh, since before the Second World War. Um, but they haven't really been scaled up. They are currently more expensive, as, is, uh, as are other forms of fuel. And this is where it's important to have the mandate, because that sends a, a demand signal from the sector to people like Shell and BP who are investing in this, as, as well as Lanzatech and Velasis and all the other um, new energy companies, so that they can start to commit to scaling up. And it is a shame to see BA investing in a plant in the US when they could be investing in the UK, because the US is, has more favorable investment conditions than the UK has. And the same with Shell. They, had, they pulled out an investment in Scotland and put their money into Canada, because Canada had a better <laughs> investment environment. The UK government can take a real lead here on setting a mandate and putting an investment incentive in place, as they have done with other sectors, to scale up sustainable aviation fuels. And we shouldn't be we shouldn't be in a world where everything is too difficult. We have to make the change that we want to see, and this is a path that we can do that in. And currently, I'd agree, uh, sustainable aviation fuels are significantly more expensive than other forms of fuel, but the as we scale up, cost will come down, um, but we will also start to see that um, if we want to fly, and there are huge benefits to flying, that may be the price that we have to pay to do it. So, Finley, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, again, um, the US produces way too much waste that, that, than it should do, and the, if, you, if you look at the environmental issue, we need to, like, reduce waste. We, we don't want to be just creating plastic, putting it in the bin rather than recycling it, then incinerating it and turning it into aviation fuel. Um, you can go through all the different strands of biofuel and try and make an argument there's a little bit of waste here and there. Even then, even if you go through everything, you still don't have anywhere near enough for aviation. But let's just, let me just give you a, it's worth thinking, even if you do have a little bit of biofuel somewhere, 
that you couldn't have composted, you couldn't have used to put carbon back into the soil, you couldn't have used for other things. You should put it into a biomass um, power plant, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage power plant, make electricity for the grid, which can heat people's homes, light their, house, light, light their houses, help them charge their electric cars. It's a very inefficient process to make it into aviation fuel and then burn it in an aircraft, which is a fundamentally inefficient mode of transport. And so, Finley, I, forgive, me, yep. Finley, forgive me for interrupting. Are you saying, sure. because are you basically saying, look, there is no way around this. We have to reduce our reliance on aviation. Is that your argument? Yeah, I'd, I'd say the, the only way of doing this is synthetic fuel. Um, as, as he's mentioned, that, that's making it industrially, right. um, using electricity to suck carbon from the air, create hydrogen, combine them to make a liquid hydrocarbon. Um, that, that's good, that's very, job. very expensive. So it, it's at the moment it would cost you 10 times the price. Um, and yes, the price will come down. But if, if you look at the best, most optimistic projections, three to five times the price. And I've done a calculation on 2018 levels of aviation fuel. You would have needed the entire UK grid capacity all year to produce enough synthetic fuel for aviation. We've got better things to use our electricity for right now. And, we're right. and Heathrow are planning to expand aviation by 60%. So we need like 150% of the grid capacity. It's a huge amount of electricity. And that's what you need to be aware of. But, but, but Finley, forgive me, John. John, am I right in understanding that, that, are you saying the same thing, i.e. that there needs to be mass investment in synthetic aviation fuels? Uh, completely, we, we're, I, I, I think we agree on that. Um, I think uh, what you're highlighting is that there are choices that uh, we have to make as a society as to how we want to use our scarce resources. That's a very legitimate debate that we want to have. But if the automatic conclusion is, let's just stop flying, then I, I would challenge that. Uh, that view. Aviation has fantastic benefits to the world and we should not give them up lightly. Um, there are benefits to trade and supporting jobs, helping millions of people around the world get out of poverty, um, helping to understand how the world works and, and bringing cultures together. We shouldn't give these, these benefits up lightly and we should look at how we can protect these benefits in a future world without, a, without uh, carbon. John, thank you. I'm Catherine Simmons, forgive me, Catherine, are you Simons or Simmons? I always get... I'm Simmons. There you are, Catherine Simmons. But you're making a similar point about actually society and its choices around our, our reliance on air travel. Mm -hmm. I am. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a question. I think I don't think you can say we should just give up flying. I'm a New Zealander. If I have to just give up flying, I can never see my parents again. But I do think we need these societal changes. And I'm, I'm intrigued, John, that um, a look, right at the end, you brought that up. Um, but most of your statements and most of what I hear from the aviation industry is all about technologies which are, uh, say, not proven at scale, require, will no doubt have huge environmental impacts elsewhere, and particularly around land use change, as Finley suggested. So I might, and I'm trying to put this in a gentle tortoise media kind of way rather than a, um, you know, sort of Sunday morning sort of thing, but... Um, Let loose, Catherine. <laughs> can you possibly think that aviation can sustainably continue at the level it has been in recent years and what's more, grow enough to even begin to justify something like Heathrow expansion, um, given the carbon crisis and other little issues like the lack of trust in the aviation industry after the last, you know, what, what's happened in the last year, this, that, all that kind of thing, but particularly around climate. I don't think we can afford to continue to fly the way we have been and I'm, I'm really surprised that the intelligent, capable people running the aviation industry can't rec don't recognize that or aren't prepared to recognize that. Well, I, I would, uh, I challenge a number of things in there. I mean, uh, first of all, we are owning this problem. Um, the, the fact that you have um, people like Heathrow and British Airways committing to net zero emissions by 2050 and getting other people to come behind a plan around the world to do something about it, that is big. That will allow um, genuine change to happen. And it is by uh, companies owning the problem and coming up with a plan to do something about it that we will see this kind of thing change. And it can change relatively quickly. 
Um, we were talking earlier about the uh, significantly higher cost of uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Well, we'd have been having exactly the same conversation about solar and wind 10 years ago, and yet we've seen the cost plummet over that time um, as we have scaled up and as new innovation has come into that technology. Now, I, I completely get that we should not be banking everything on unproven technology, but much of this is proven technology, and there's a lot of work has, has uh, gone into it. And with a mandate, the industry will have to earn its way. Um, it will force change within the sector um, so that as, uh, as uh, we get through to um, uh, 2030, we will be starting to see a very significant change in the way in which we power the planes that we run. And we know from other sectors that change can happen quickly if there is enough investment in energy going in behind them. Um, you would not have thought that um, electric cars would have taken off in the way they have had it not been for Tesla coming in and then governments getting behind a real change in the way that we work. So change can happen quickly. Uh, we need to be optimistic about making that happen, but put some policies and investment behind making it happen. And uh, you are a good example of why um, long haul aviation is important. Of all the kinds of aviation we should be preserving, that is the most valuable because there is no alternative to long haul aviation for getting uh, people to New Zealand in a sensible length of time. I can completely understand arguments for why short distances should be taken by train or by electric vehicle, um, but for long haul aviation, uh, that is uh, something for which there is no credible substitute. And that's why we have to find a zero carbon alternative to the way in which we, we fly long haul at the moment. And that's where sustainable aviation fuels will be part of the solution. John, can I just pick up though, when you say that we can do things quickly, and I think everyone, you know, in the light of what we've seen in the last year is sort of struck by, you know, vaccine development, put your minds to it, what you can achieve. One of the things, just picking up on Catherine's point, is that it's really hard to have much confidence, public confidence in the transition when the target date is 2050. 2050, you know, without getting too existential about it, we may not be here either to prove that you didn't do it or to celebrate that you did. You know, why is it not the case that the aviation industry is getting together and saying, look, our target date is 2035 or even 2030? Why is it so far in the distance? Well, perhaps I should clarify <clears throat> how, how we see a mandate working. Um, because I, I, I agree, there's no point having a, a single target that is 30 years away or 29 years away now. There needs to be stages by which you get this. And actually the biggest change needs to happen by 2030 if we are going to have a good chance of hitting the 2050 target because the significant investment has to go in in the next decade. And uh, so that's why we need quick government action around the mandate. And the way I see a mandate working is that it is progressively increasing the proportion of sustainable fuels that have to be blended with kerosene over time, um, going through with a target for um, uh, sometime in the 2020s, target for 2030, and then progressively increasing targets as we get through to 2050. And that's a, that's a set of mandates where we need some consistency around the world. And it may well be that a bit like uh, we've seen with electric vehicles, governments compete with each other for how quickly they want to make the transition. But at the moment, they are cautious about making those changes because if you have a tough mandate within one country, um, then what we'll see is that, um, and that, that country alone um, sets the mandate, we'll see uh, that people are uploading fuel in other countries where they don't have the mandate to avoid um, uh, uh, being limited by it. By that we've been there before with uh, uh, with um, some of the um, uh, uh, carbon trading schemes that the, the EU is trying to bring in, and that's why we need some consistency in the policies that we have, and that's why an, an, an agreement with ICAO, um, the global governing body for aviation, is so important. And I think that now we have airlines in in Russia and the and, and Europe and the Middle East and, and the States. And we've got the Biden administration championing um, action around climate change. I think we have a good chance of getting that. Okay. So, John, I'm going to just, uh, uh, there were a number of people who've got their hands up. I can see Don Tyler's <coughs> hand up. Um, um, Fanula O'Connor has got uh, a point about short haul versus long haul. So I'm going to come to uh, Fanula too. And my colleague Tess Murray's got a point. So 
Um, why don't I start with Don, Tyler, if I might. Hi. Um, yeah, sorry, no video for me either. Um, Too early in the morning. Absolutely. Um, I think the, uh, the point we've been making, just going back slightly to the sustainable fuels and talking about, for example, increasing the amount of sustainable fuels required to be mixed into um, aviation fuel over time. Um, I just want to put in like a little counterpoint. Um, I've done a lot of work with the steel industry um, and they are also talking about the fact that they're going to move towards more sustainable methods of steel making. Uh, it's a big emitter of um, uh, a big uh, sort of carbon emitter at the moment and they're also saying well actually yes there is enough capacity in the world to grow the amount of biofuels we need for steel industry but of course those two things butt up against each other i think at the moment every industry is saying at the moment you know we have the capacity in the electric grid we have the capacity in um, land area for for growing biofuels in order to decarbonize our industry but they look at those things in isolation and that then becomes a point, well, what's more important to us, building almost all infrastructure or flying? And I think it's a difficult issue that we can't just say, uh, I think um, Finney made the point, you know, we need the entire UK's grid output to make the amount of synthetic fuel. Well, say we double the grid output, what is that, you know, you know, of one grid output per year going to be used on? Is it the steel industry? Is it flying? Is it something else entirely? Yeah, Don, thank, Don, thank you. John, John, before you answer, I'm just going to actually ask a few people to contribute. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a note of a sort of double counting sector by sector, Don, that you point that you've made. Um, but Fanola, are you there? Can, can we hear from you? Hello? Let's see. What we... Oh, you're are Sorry, you muted by this... us. That would be... um... yeah, there you are. You are. Great. Um, yeah, it's really just the, yeah. the point that several people have made about the, the alternatives to short haul flying being orders of magnitude more expensive. Um, I think, you know, there's obviously, um, I think Catherine made the point about the cost of the infrastructure, track is really expensive, but aren't the ways, I, I mean, aren't the ways to be utilizing those resources much more. I mean, the train track that runs just by my back garden doesn't have that many trains running on it. Every time I go to Heathrow, there are planes circling in the sky waiting to get in. So is it an issue of one, just maximizing assets? And is it also an issue of um, cost allocation of you know, thinking about the environmental costs? So really my question, John, is you, know, you seem to be saying that short haul flying is not such an essential, but how do you see yourself working with other industries and with government to make that actually viable? Thank you. John, do you want to take both of those? The sort of yeah, double count? please. And um, I, I, think, I think this question about how can we do everything is, is obviously a hugely important one. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure you have seen the work that, um, that uh, Adair Turner uh, has done with the Energy Transitions Commission, which looks at exactly this question of how can you decarbonize all the difficult to abate sectors in parallel with each other? And is there, is there a way in which you can do that without them all competing for the same resources? And their conclusion was that you could, um, and that, uh, and that, but, but that you had to make choices. And one of which was that um, you had to avoid other sectors using, um, using um, energy from waste. Uh, bio, biofuels from waste for uh, uh, to power their transition because the least substitutable sector is long haul aviation and it should be protected for that. Now, um, and what they did as part of that work was to look at what the alternatives should be for each of the sectors and what would it take to uh, deliver um, that energy capacity. So um, uh, they published that about uh, two years ago now and they've since been doing work on how do you fill in the gaps behind it? And the sustainable aviation plan that we launched back in February of last year was based on um, that template that Adair Turner had set out. Um, so you know, none of this is easy. Uh, it all involves uh, massive investment to make the transition. But that's what we need to do if we're to have um, anything like the, uh, the um, uh, structure for our economy and society um, in a decarbonized world. And, the, and change can happen uh, relatively quickly. To, to, to Penilla's point about uh, alternatives to short haul flying, there is a role for, for short haul flying. There's the, there are loads of places that you can't get to 
um, by anything else than uh, short wall flying. And actually, a good good example: um, the, uh, the the demise of Flybe um, earlier this year um, cut off a lot of UK regions from one another because there is no direct way of connecting between them. And many many people relied on those routes if you wanted to get from uh, the southwest up to the northeast. Aviation was the only uh, credible way of doing that. Um, but um, uh, uh, if if you can make the journey by uh, by uh, alternative routes, then um, then clearly uh, you should do so. Um, but there will be places within the UK which can only be connected by aviation. And and actually, um, one of the things that we are passionate about is that um, we need to protect the link into. Uh, into Heathrow for places like Belfast and Aberdeen and Inverness and uh, maybe Newquay, which have no alternative um, form of, of transport to get to connect those regions quickly to the places that, that uh, the people who live there need to get to, other than by going by air. John, thank you. I'm going to bring in my colleague Tess Murray and then uh, Julian Ranger in a moment. Tess. Um, so I've just suddenly realised I'm sitting here in my gym kit, like I'm sort of channeling my inner flash dance this morning. Sorry, everyone. Um, you actually touched slightly on the point I was going to make, which was do you um, about the sort of whether we're going to see consolidation in those small regional airports. You know, we've seen the demise of the, the airlines that service them. Um, and it got me thinking about uh, the sort of the short haul electric plane alternative for those to solve some of those sort of in-country uh, transport challenges, which then stick with my train of thought, got me thinking about the UK government's investment in zero avia in the States and thinking, well, are we actually backing? I know that we, you know, we had Neil, um, what's his chance? Uh, Neil Cloughley, I think from, um, oh God, I've lost it, I can't remember. Anyway, our future of, um, travel um thinking uh, last year actually it was, and it was brilliant so my train of thought went regional access small uh, journey um electric planes you know 350 mile range yada yada which are being developed i believe and then and then looking at where the government's deploying its investment and focus which seems to be supporting some of the you know, big initiatives in the States, along with the Bezos and Gates money going into it and thinking, are we, are we looking at our own solutions? Are we building our own solutions internally? And is short haul electric actually a quicker and faster solution to, um, you know, the absolute uh, in inaccessibility, you know, the fact you can't go from Manchester yeah. to Leeds, you know, sort of thing. Anyway. No, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. And I, 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 I didn't really talk about um, electric for short haul because um, the, uh, it is long haul, which is the biggest challenge for decarbonisation. But you're, you're, you're completely right. Um, electric will have a role for short haul flying. EasyJet are doing a lot of work um, uh, work on this. Um, countries like Norway and Scotland have set uh, targets, uh, quite short term targets, for converting their domestic flying to, uh, to electric. And those are the kind of policies that will push the manufacturers to really um, invest to scale up um, in that area. And do you think government investment is right? And do you think do you think there's enough support from government for that sort of investment? I don't think so. I mean, this is a this is a big transition that needs to be made, and you know, governments have to make their choices about where they where they choose to invest. Um, but you know, electric flight will have a uh, will have an important role to play in all of our lives. Um, it is uh, it brings its own challenges with it. So um, with sustainable aviation fuels, you could have an entirely uh, SAP powered long haul flight going one way and load up with kerosene coming back again. Um, so it's quite versatile. With, with an electric flight, if you've run out of battery by the time you get to your destination, there's no charging facility, then <laughs> there's no good. Um, so there's a massive infrastructure investment required. You've got to have the, the generation capacity, you've got to have the charging points. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a big investment to be made in the ground in order to power those electric planes. None of this is impossible. Uh, it just needs to be very carefully planned. And that's where government has a role to make decisions about how to deploy different types of energy generation for different types of sectors and to make sure the policies are in place to encourage the transition as fast as possible. And a lot of this will be invest will be private sector investment, not government investment. John, before, before we before we finish, Tess, thank you very much. Before we finish, I just wanted to come to Julian Ranger because 
One of the conversations from last night, which was around vaccines, was actually about vaccine passports and health passports. Uh, and Julian Range and I had a sort of email exchange before this started. Julian, do you, do you want to put the point to John because it, it gets us back into the here and now? Yeah, hi, John. Um, so there's quite a lot of discussion on the need for health and vaccine passports to support the return to wider travel. So I wondered what your view was on that. And then sort of expanding a bit further, this data is medical data and needs to be treated with great care and security. So I wondered what you see as the barriers to effective adoption of those passes, if indeed you agree that they're needed. Well, um, I, I wouldn't talk about uh, uh, health passports or vaccine passports because that, that immediately starts people thinking that this is a formal government document that needs to be monitored at the border. Um, I'd put it a different way, which is that um, we will, uh, for some time to come, need to demonstrate um, for uh, for some or all flights that we've either had a test, we've had a vaccine, or, or um, we're, we're in, in, in some other way safe. So how do you make sure that you can do that in an efficient way? Having a printed piece of paper um, is, can, can work, but it's not, it's not efficient and, uh, and um, uh, is not secure either. So there needs to be an, a, a more digital way of doing that. And this exists for, um, in, in some other areas. And, and in fact, there are um, companies that have been working on solutions to this for uh, most of the last year. Uh, people like Common Pass and AOK Pass um, have uh, been yeah. developing and, and testing this kind of solution. Um, and because it is effectively a secure electronic passport, some of these are just held on, on your phone through, um, through the kind of health apps that many of us have then uh, there isn't any transmission of data, there's just a confirmation that you have had whatever test that you, you need to be able to demonstrate you've had. And I think that will be uh, something that uh, we need some global standards on in the same way that there are global standards on uh, checking visas and that kind of thing, uh, which, are, which equally need uh, a level of security. So um, this, this will be part of uh, the future world of travel. We shouldn't get um, overly emotional um, and political about it, uh, we just need to find a, an efficient um, uh, electronic process for verifying that you've had um, the test or the vaccine that you need to have had to make the journey you want to make. John, th John thank you. Um, I realise we, 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 we've run out of time. It's strange that we started off by saying, you know, we've got tons of time as an hour and now you get through it and you realise actually there's so much more you'd like to... To, to, to discuss and, and understand. Um, can I just say a thank you though? A thank you first actually to, you know, Lily and Finley and Catherine and, uh, uh, and Julian and, and everyone else for, for weighing in on these issues. It feels so often, particularly around climate these days, that there's a mixture of either sort of righteous anger or optimism bias. And it's very hard to bring people together who actually have, a, a set of data, a set of information available to them and try and you know, contest it in a way in which we've done in the last hour. So a big thank you to them. But John, a big thank you to you. You can, you can appreciate that there's such passion and such concern in this area around uh, net zero. And it's hard to get the chance to listen to someone like you, hear what you're trying to do, appreciate some of the choices that, uh, that you're making and the pressures that you're, uh, that you're facing and learn a little about how it looks uh, from where you sit. So a big thank you to you for your time this morning. I realise it's now only nine o'clock, but we feel as though we've had a you know proper spin around the world and a look at the next 30 years. So uh, we, we've, done, we've done pretty well before we've even got started today. Uh, we can't give you a round of applause, but we can wave you cheerily on your way today. So thank you, John. Thanks, thanks, everyone. thanks everyone. Nice to see you. Bye.